Welcome to our series of lectures on history, theology, and philosophy, an ongoing series that we normally do uh, in person here at Toronto Center Place. Uh, but obviously during uh, this time period, during the pandemic, when uh, no one is meeting together in person, we are uh, live streaming these events so we can all stay connected. Uh, and also continue to explore all of these topics as we are sheltering in place uh, wherever we are uh, locally and around the world. Um, this is our, our local history, theology, philosophy uh, meetup. My name is John Hamer and I serve as the coordinator of the meetup uh, by background and academic training. I'm a historian and I've been a professional math maker and, map maker and also uh, a theologian within my own denomination, Community of Christ, and I serve as the pastor of the congregation here, Center Place. We always begin with our mission, which is to invite everyone into community, and our congregation uh, is an inclusive, welcoming community. We um, uh, all are welcome in at right now virtually as we continue to hold all of our activities uh, via live stream to continually learn and grow. Uh, through exploration of topics like this, to abolish poverty and end needless suffering, promote peace and justice, and to live life meaningfully together. And even though we are separated physically, um, our lives do go on and we have to uh, make these additional connections and efforts in order to continue to live life in a meaningful way in these uh, trying times. Um, as always, we thank you for your contributions. Um, it's a tough time for everywhere in the entire global economy. If you are able to make donations for, to us uh, to help our ongoing um, capacity to uh, continue to live stream and do other kinds of events, um, anyway, you can always do so and the tax receipts are available for uh, uh, if you're a resident of the U.S. or Canada, you can go to our website, centerplace.ca. We thank you so very much. Next week, um, uh, our topic is going to be Lessons from the Black Death. So we are going to look at the uh, greatest or the worst um, pandemic in global history in the middle of the 14th century, uh, when somewhere in the range of a third or maybe more of uh, people spread across Eurasia and Africa, kind of, uh, and North Africa, um, culminating in um, just a massive proportions of, of death in, in Europe uh, in the middle of the 14th century. We're going to look at you know, what that did to society, uh, what it's like when, um, let's say, and you're in a city and one in every two people are gone. Uh, what is it like for the survivors? What are even just some of the logistics? Uh, what were some of the economic consequences of it? Um, there's no way in the way our society is now that you know, the worst that a pandemic could be. We have uh, so many procedures and all of the things that we've taken, these extreme measures um, that we've taken globally for the very first time in response to a pandemic um, has the uh, probably the net effect of uh, massively uh, preventing the kind of deaths that they would have had uh, in medieval times. But nevertheless, we'll look at um, how that was experienced by the people at that time. And just on this theme, <laughs> the next week um, we'll have a lecture uh, on biblical plagues uh, from Exodus to the book of Revelation. So we'll look at how um, plagues are, are talked about or how they are narrated in the Bible, and we will look at them. Um, in most cases, we're talking about um, for example, the plagues of Egypt, which historians do not believe are historical. Uh, nevertheless, they have a lot of theological implications uh, that we're going to want to take a look at. So that will be uh, the following week. But our um, lecture tonight, I want to welcome you to, is the Bible as seen through Reformation lenses. So. Um, one of the things that we have to always be aware of when we are looking at the past is that uh, the past is only seen very dimly through the lenses of the present. Uh, 
And no matter what we do, um, no matter how good we are and how much context, how aware, how much history we've, we've read, there's always going to be some degree uh, of what we call presentism uh, that is going to be inevitable in our picture of the past since we live only in the present and we uh, can only have the, you know, reconstruct the past from our perspective where we are in history. So what is presentism? There's um, going to be about, I want to go through about five different um, uh, red flags in terms of presentism that is just always in front of us. So one of them is um, the perspective of knowing what happened after the fact. So from our perch at this place in history, we know all kinds of things that have happened uh, in ways that none of the people, let's say, experiencing the things at the time, they had no idea what the future was going to uh, hold. The future was as yet unwritten. They might have anticipated different possibilities. They had no idea what would happen and what wouldn't happen. In many, many cases, um, uh, breakthroughs or changes or things happen uh, in the course of history that are entirely unpredictable uh, by people that existed in the past. And so, for example, let's use just an example here, the Treaty of Versailles. Knowing, as we do, that the peace uh, that took place between the First and Second World Wars was relatively brief. World War I, this massive um, conflagration, this uh, greatest war that had ex existed at all of human history at that time had been fought with the premise that it was a war that would end all wars, and yet, just 21 years later, um, an even potentially more massive war uh, broke out, World War II. Um, and so given the fact that that period of time actually was relatively brief, as we now know, and given the fact that later um, uh, the Nazis claimed, for example, that the Treaty of Versailles in 1918 had been unduly harsh to Germany, it's a very frequent narrative then that this treaty was inherently flawed, that it was um, mean-spirited into Germany and therefore in inevitably led to a backlash and therefore it was itself a major cause of World War II. That's just a frequent narrative we have. However, um, um, I would say that that's generally a narrative that we know knowing what we know, or the, that's from our side. Um, that future, that World War II was totally unknown to the leaders in 1918. And in fact, when historians examine the treaty in the context of the recent past, in other words, not thinking, not considering about the future, um, it actually isn't that far out of line with the kind of treaties that the European powers um, had been uh, conducting for the preceding you know, century or half century. Uh, so in general, um, the defeated power was usually required to cede territory and very often always uh, to pay reparations. Those were the norm and so may not have been unduly harsh. I mean, nevertheless, I'm not saying here that that doesn't mean that Versailles uh, was not a cause of World War II, but we always need to be aware of that kind of context, uh, the contemporary context, in order to make our assessments. So that's one aspect of presentism. Here's another aspect of presentism. So I've written out here my own timeline uh, from being born in 1970 to being here in front of you right now in 2020. So it's a half century timeline so far. Uh, hopefully it'll go another half century. We'll see what happens. <laughs> but anyway, there are these different points um, along the timeline and given where I am now, this big red dot, uh, which is to say, given that I am the pastor of a congregation uh, that um, uh, is interested in exploring things like leading these kinds of history, theology, philosophy lectures, um, that is uh, engaged in um, different kinds of outreach, what we might say to finding meaning for people, for example, who are not involved in traditional religion. So that's a kind of where I am, and based on where I have gotten to, um, there are different parts and different moments in my timeline that um, maybe have relatively more importance um, in the retrospect, uh, because they can, you can draw the line to see how that got me to here. 
So if I'm telling my personal life story, my history, maybe I'm emphasizing more um, because of where I am, my religious background. So the idea that I was raised uh, uh, an active Mormon in the LDS church, uh, that I became a doubting teenager, that I left the church as an adult, and it was only in finding um, uh, this uh, tradition, the community of Christ, that I uh, and found, discovered a very different type of denomination that I became involved again in organized religion. So those, maybe those points um, take an un, let's say, those are seen as important because of my present uh, presentism, because I understand where I, what ended up actually happening. However, let's say, if we, let's say there was an alternative timeline where I just ended up being a history professor at a university somewhere. Well, then suddenly all of those red dots along my timeline may not have been anywhere near as important because they really aren't relevant to that uh, story as we know what happened of me becoming a history professor. Instead, all of these moments when um, I uh, grew to love history, when I gave like a very important report in junior high that, um, that showed my, kind of it had my love of history or had a great um, uh, teacher in 11th grade in high school who mentored me, those kind of things maybe led me to that completely different academic career. Now those maybe uh, points seem more important. And so um, if we avoid the presentism, we actually, what we need to ask is, what was important at the time? So maybe it wasn't those red things that now seem so important because of this red conclusion that I have, or the blue things that my, are in an alternate timeline. Maybe there were other things that were happening uh, in my life that seemed very important at the time, um, but didn't seem to go anywhere in terms of how we understand. So that's another um, serious presentist thing to avoid. The future is unwritten. And we have to kind of go back to recover uh, as close to the contemporary uh, evidence at, at the time so we can see what was important to the people uh, and their era. Another component of presentism is imposing our values on the past. So I'll use an example here. Uh, Cato the Younger, who is in the first century BC, the last throes of the uh, Roman Republic before its fall uh, to the empire. Um, he's a Roman statesman. He's a leader of the Optimates faction, the nobles party in the Roman Senate, and that's the party that opposes the populares, the, the, uh, the demagogic party, the party of the people uh, that had leaders like Marius and ultimately Caesar. So when Julius Caesar defeats Cato's faction during uh, the Roman Civil War, the first Civil War, Cato uh, commits suicide rather than accepts uh, Caesar's pardon. So Caesar would have pardoned many of the senators and might have pardoned, probably would have pardoned Cato, but he didn't want to even say or admit, okay, that you're the winner or that you have a right to rule. And so instead, honor demanded uh, that he commit suicide in his view. Okay, so in the present day, um, for a healthy person to kill themselves for a point of honor is alien to most of us in Western society. Um, however, if we um, simply use our values to condemn Cato's actions as immoral based on those kind of present values, um, I'll suggest that we will really fail to understand him. And to then know him, we need to understand his culture's values and context rather than using ours to condemn him. Okay, um, understanding requires that context. However, although uh, to understand the figures of the past, we have to understand their historical context, that doesn't mean that we need to abandon our values and then become apologists for past figures and saying things like, oh, well, it's really good that uh, uh, suicide, honor suicides or something like that, that that's something that's really a great thing because that was what was important in the time. Um, likewise, for example, uh, uh, one of the most important and influential early Christian leaders, the Apostle Paul, uh, wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, quote, slaves obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling and singleness of heart as you obey Christ. So a pretty... Um, uh, overt, uh, uh, anyway, uh, 
in statement in favor of, of maintaining the status quo in regards to the institution of slavery. Okay, so um, one error in presentism is misinterpreting those past authorities. So some Christians in a few centuries ago um, uh, regularly abused that passage of scripture to argue that 18th and 19th century uh, uh, racial, race-based slavery in uh, Europe and North America was ordained uh, by God. Uh, rather than uh, fall into that presentism, we should understand that Paul lived in a society founded on slavery that was quite different, frankly, than uh, 19th century slavery, uh, the Greco-Roman world. But nevertheless, it's a society where no one almost could even conceive of a society without slave labor. So uh, when Plato uh, is writing The Republic, when people are talking about perfect utopias, they haven't even been, they can't get past the idea that there's gonna, there's gonna be slaves in these, in these societies because they aren't even able to conceive of such a society without slavery. Um, nevertheless, we should also avoid apologetics. So although understanding Paul's historical context helps us understand Paul, and it understands, us, understands why he never conceived of condemning slavery, we should not engage in apologetics on his behalf. I don't think we should be arguing, oh, well, slavery was okay in Paul's day. Um, I think uh, any um, uh, objective analysis of how slaves were treated and what slaves went through in the ancient world uh, would show that slavery was, frankly, horrific in Paul's day. So um, anyway, we can't have that kind of uh, apologetics either. So that's a presentism we should also avoid. Um, here's a couple more kinds <laughs> of presentisms that we should avoid. Um, anachronisms. So anachronisms uh, are, are things that are out of, out of their um, place in history. Uh, ha imposing things in our picture of the past that didn't exist in the past. Um, this picture here in my slide here is a 16th century Portuguese depiction of Julius Caesar. And if he doesn't look like how maybe you would picture Julius Caesar with a toga and all this kind of thing, instead he of course looks like um, a 16th century king in fancy um, early modern armor, uh, uh, and indeed with the, with the coat of arms of the Holy Roman Empire uh, of Germany. And so therefore fully anachronistic um, to uh, what we know about the actual fashion and uh, armaments and technology and such. Uh, of Roman times, of Caesar's times. Um, likewise, in Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, um, at a given moment in Act Two, Scene One, uh, the clock strikes three. Uh, but of course, clocks are an invention of the Middle Ages. There were no clocks striking any hour at all in uh, antiquity in Julius Caesar's actual time. So it's relatively easy for us to identify these kind of technological anachronisms uh, from where we are in history. Um, those kind of things are, for example, physical inventions uh, that did not exist in the past era. However, it's a lot more difficult for us to avoid the anachronisms of ideas. So in addition to having um, fashion change or to have technological developments, there's also uh, uh, developments uh, intellectually, that there are developments in terms of the invention of ideas. And when an idea gets invented, what ends up happening usually is that our entire paradigm changes. We view the world in light of that idea, now that we understand it, and we really, frankly, can no longer imagine how the world could have been seen without it. And I'll just have to give like a, a couple little idea, um, examples here. But so here, this is a picture is of the ruins of the temple at the Oracle of Delphi. The motto of the Oracle of Delphi was know thyself. Um, and yet, uh, historians of, of ideas have fairly clearly shown that our concept of the self, the modern concept of the self, uh, is, a, is a relatively recent modern development, an idea that was uh, begun and to be created uh, in the Enlightenment. Uh, and so what does the phrase know thyself mean before uh, the invention of self, before this idea uh, that we have, for example, when I did my timeline and said, well, there's different moments developmentally that caused me to uh, 
uh, develop one way or the other. That's not understood at all that way in antiquity. Rather, you have a faded uh, person and, I, and who you actually are meant to be, uh, and you don't have these kind of things where you develop into any number of possible different people uh, the way we now understand the self. Uh, and so know thyself uh, at Delphi uh, was more likely to mean something like know your place, know your station, know that you were born to be a cobbler. If you try to rise above that and become uh, a leader, a statesman or something like that, the gods will strike you down for your hubris. Know your place. It's more like that. So um, our ideas then are the products of our context. Uh, like I mentioned, the clock is invented in the Middle Ages. Well, the medieval invention of the mechanical clock led to the picture of a universe, our universe, as a mechanism with a clockmaker god. And before we had those kind of mechanisms, before people saw that and saw how that was all whirling around, they never pictured the universe as a mechanism, as a clock, because they didn't have a mechanism or a clock to think of, to think by analogy of. But after uh, they had that mechanism, they almost couldn't stop thinking of the uh, universe that way. Um, oh, I missed a slide here. Another one that's similar like to that, and I didn't mention it anyway, I don't have the slide here for it, but anyway, is our modern invention of the computer. Uh, and so Nowadays, now that we have computers, we can't help but think of our brains as computers. Um, and this is a, you know, we, we think if we talk about how what, what we're hardwired, we talk about our hardware, our software, you know, essentially have programs and this kind of thing. <coughs> computers are so ubiquitous in our life that we just can't help but uh, use that analogy. However, uh, within our memory even, so The Wizard of Oz is not even a century old here as a movie, it's already in the era of color, um, back then, uh, people weren't thinking of, of, of artificial people like the Tin Man as mechan uh, I'm sorry, as computers. They were thinking of them as mechanical objects, as mechanisms, because they didn't have the idea of computers yet. So they weren't. No one thought of the things the way we just naturally do uh, in that time period, which is still, like I say, a time period when some people are still alive from then. So I wanted to have that kind of vast. Um, Anyway, introduction here of these kind of lenses because this is a major theme that we approach in our history, theology, philosophy lectures, awareness of the kind of lenses through which we view uh, the past. And that's something that we need to especially be aware of uh, when we are looking at an ancient text like the Bible. Uh, and the Bible is in fact a collection of many, many ancient texts that are written uh, over the course of hundreds of years in different languages by different people with very different uh, perspectives, but all of whose perspectives are frankly quite alien to our 21st century perspectives. And when we simply read them at face value and understand them, uh, let's say, just as a narrative or as, as a history, um, uh, within our present idea uh, universe that we have, our present worldview, uh, we so radically distort this text um, that we have lost any of its original meaning usually. So I want to look at then um, the Bible and how the Bible was viewed before and after a pivotal moment in Christian history, uh, this time period in the 16th century in the West, uh, when Protestants and Catholics uh, went into schism uh, and are no, no longer in, in communion with each other. So nowadays, in the 21st century, um, the Bible's pretty ubiquitous. We are in a period of decline when the uh, biblical literacy and this sort of thing um, is way down from where it would have been a century or two centuries ago. Nevertheless, some five billion or more copies of the Bible have been printed. Uh, the book is still widely considered the best-selling and uh, many, many different um, uh, listings that historians do and other things like that listed as the most influential book of all times. Um, certainly when we think of 21st century Christianity, uh, 
reading and study of the Bible is at the center of Christian practice, and in fact, even worship uh, services often focus on readings from the Bible and sermons about the Bible. Um, uh, lots of Protestants uh, identify themselves as Bible-based Christians uh, because by the Bible really is the central focus of the entire uh, religion. And that maybe just seems like to us the way it always would have been. Um, however, before the 15th century and 16th century, before that time period, this massive change, um, what we point at, we can maybe also realize is that the Reformation corresponded with um, a technological breakthrough that was also amazingly important, the invention of the printing press. So prior to 1440, each copy of the text had to be written out by hand, an amazingly um, laborious and incredibly expensive uh, process. And so um, if you can imagine just how much work it is to write an entire book as long as the Bible out, <coughs> excuse me, it was very rarely done. Uh, usually there would only be, you'd get sections um, and it would be collected up into parts as opposed to having an entire bound Bible um, together. And if you can imagine that um, every sheet of the paper too, you had to um, create the parchment from sheepskin, uh, just so the sheep is involved. In other words, this is just an amazingly expensive and time-consuming process. So in addition to that, though, um, the texts were written in languages, Latin and Greek, especially in the West, then in Latin, uh, that were known only to the scholarly class. So even if you were a layperson who was literate in your own language, let's say medieval English or medieval French, um, you wouldn't necessarily be able to, I mean, you wouldn't just immediately be able to read the text of the Bible unless you also learned uh, this foreign language, Latin. Um, and so as a result of that, reading the Bible was not a part of the everyday Christian experience in the Middle Ages or in antiquity the way it is uh, in the 21st century. Instead, what did Christians do? The Christian experience of the Middle Ages, um, the Bible was still studied, but it was studied by experts, the clerics, the monks that were in the monasteries, the nuns in the monasteries, the priests. The lay people would have experienced the stories of the Bible um, through sermons that they would listen to, um, which were less important proportionally, though, <coughs> excuse me, in Christian worship as opposed to uh, uh, Christian worship today, uh, but also through artwork, the stained glass windows, the relief sculptures and frescoes that were all over the church, um, through things like plays. Uh, in all of those ways, um, they would tend to uh, um, live those stories and ideas, would live in a very different way than reading them um, as a literate text. So you're reading it and you're experiencing that in a different way. Uh, but even then, the center of Christian worship would have been spiritual practices, practices including especially uh, uh, participation in the sacraments, and observing, for example, the Christian calendar, uh, which would go through all of these fasts and feasts and festivals. As a result, if we look at this, um, there's a radically different experience, past and present, between that medieval Christian experience and ancient Christian experience and the one of the present. So let's look a little bit at the Reformation context and what was going on. So although the Reformation, again, I mean the early 16th century has begun as an attempt to seek reforms within the Christian church, the Latin church, the effect of the Reformation was schism. So Protestant leaders argued um, that the primitive church, the first Christians, had been led into apostasy by adopting pagan traditions at the time that the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity and made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. So some of the more radical Protestants, the Anabaptists, called this the great apostasy. Up until this time, traditionally in Christianity, there were four pillars of authority. And so these were apostolic succession, tradition, uh, the church fathers, which is to say the earliest Christian writers that are not uh, part of the scripture, 
and also the Bible. So for Protestants, some of these were um, immediately problematic. So um, if you go from uh, apostolic succession, Protestants are arguing here that the Pope is Antichrist. And so therefore you lose apostolic succession if you are no longer um, going to argue the successor of St. Peter has any uh, authority. Second, tradition. Um, the Protestants argue here the tradition is essentially paganism. <laughs> so what's happened is that all of these things like Christmas are just simply masquerading for pagan holidays. Uh, all kinds of other practices um, are just contamination of the Christian religion by the earlier paganism, the compromises that Christian, Christianity had to make uh, in antiquity. So you've dropped out tradition as unreliable. Uh, the Protestants argue that the church fathers, you know, they're actually often bishops. Um, they, they don't tend to support a lot of the kinds of things, the reforms that the, uh, that the Protestants would like to have them argue. And so they essentially also argue against most of their teachings as well. And that leaves out of these four pillars of authority, uh, just one surviving pillar, the Bible. So that's all you got left. Uh, as the source of authority for Protestants. And so um, that becomes uh, the major point of division between the two groups. So Catholics retain all of those four traditional sources of authority, including tradition, apostolic succession, the ideas of the Church Fathers and the Bible, whereas for Protestants, the Bible becomes the sole source of authority through the uh, doctrine of sola scriptura, which is that the Bible is the sole source of authority. Unfortunately, the functional problem uh, with sola scriptura, so Bible is the only source of authority, and yet every single person approaches the Bible as a reader from their own particular time and place. Each reader approaches the text in their own context. The text does not always speak directly to our present day, uh, and so as a result of that, it invites multiple different interpretations. And in essentially, um, every single person who reads the Bible has their own interpretation because they have their own time and place and context in history. Their inevitable result, uh, and this is why uh, Protestantism has um, uh, continued to uh, fissure and, and go into smaller and smaller churches and groups while the Catholic Church largely remains one institution, um, the result is sectarianism, as people with different uh, readings, interpretations, and priorities read the Bible, decide different things are the important bits, and as a result, we have Lutherans and Baptists, Calvinists, Anglicans, Methodists, and so on and so forth. So, um, as a result of this uh, focus on Scripture, the Protestants create, I think, what is a completely novel relationship with Scripture. So from what had been the Christian experience, which was a wide array of traditional practices, sacramental life, the festivals, uh, a focus on monasticism, Protestants narrowed their focus to the Bible and to personal reading of the text. Uh, this novel focus then created a very different relationship with the text. And also one of the things that happened is that as individuals are reading the text, individuals who have essentially no training uh, in the universities, unlike the, the preceding priests and clerics who were, went to, anyway, Oxford and, and, and the Sorbonne and so on and so forth in order to study these, um, it was read uh, by non-specialists, just by everybody, and their reading uh, without that kind of context, without that kind of training, uh, increasingly is read literally, and it creates, uh, therefore, a different, a very novel and new understanding of Scripture that had ever existed before. So how, how had Scripture been read before? Uh, I want to look a little bit about how in antiquity, uh, in ancient times, and also in the Middle Ages, how uh, Scripture had been read. And as always, we tend to go back to um, the great thinker in Western uh, Latin Christened, uh, Christianity, St. Augustine, shown here being baptized in the late fourth century by uh, Bishop Ambrose of Milan. Uh, 
Um, Augustine laid out uh, the way scripture should be interpreted that became kind of the core uh, focus of classical and medieval interpretation. So literal, sure, you could read scripture literally, he said, but this is the lowest and least important way to understand scripture, that it's a story that happened. So definitely and often it is the case that he would, they would read it as a story that happened. And so, yes, indeed, but that doesn't really matter because actually there are other layers to view it that are more important, three additional layers. So the next layer of interpretation is the allegorical, which is to say, what does this story signify? What is this a sign of? Next, the tropological or moral, what is the lesson of the story? What is the story teaching us? And finally, the anagogical, the reasoning upwards, the real purpose of scripture, how does this story point us to the divine? And so all of these um, are layered. And so yes, there is a literal interpretation, um, but it's hardly the, the, uh, the focus of almost anything in the Middle Ages and, and, and in antiquity before it. Uh, Bernard of Clairvaux, the great um, uh, preacher of the 12th century who was the preacher of the, of the Second Crusade and this kind of thing, he, he uh, one of the leaders, popularizers of the Cistercian orders of monasticism, he writes this amazingly long commentary on the Song of Solomon. And if you've ever read the Song of Solomon, the Song of Songs, um, it's a pretty um, body uh, love poem that uh, doesn't really have any references to God or anything like that. And the idea that um, a Christian mystic in the Middle Ages could write you know, a multi-volume um, interpretation and commentary on this text, the way he does that is because he interprets it um, allegorically um, as a love story between God, between Christ and the church. And so really the literal component of it has almost no meaning because what's important here is, uh, is the allegory, the morals, and indeed finally, how does it point us to God? So um, didn't the medieval people believe that uh, Bible accounts actually happened though? And so, in a sense, that answer is yes. They believe that the Bible accounts, like Noah's Ark, uh, actually happened. However, they didn't believe it happened the way we understand history, uh, with our sort of exacting historical awareness, with our understanding of historicity that has developed in the last couple hundred years with the development of the academic discipline of history. So, for example, in the past, there was a general unawareness of historicity. Um, this is on the left, a 14th century English depiction of the philosophers Socrates, Seneca, and Aristotle. So these are ancient Greek philosophers, and they're dressed here as 14th century English clerics. And the reason for that is that uh, the people in 14th century England are, were very unaware that the ancient Greeks would have been dressed any differently than the way they dressed because they had no awareness of historicity. Likewise, uh, their contemporaries over here in the, on the right in a 13th century Turkish depiction, uh, we have Socrates again and his students, uh, and they're dressed with their turbans as 13th century Turks. So this is simply how people in the Middle Ages were not aware of historicity. Likewise here is the 14th century, a French uh, depiction of Moses being pursued by Pharaoh. And Pharaoh here is a, got his uh, chainmail armor on uh, and he is followed by his army of knights. Uh, and so again, um, they're not aware in 14th century France um, that anything much has happened. They don't, they don't aware of historicity. Do they think that these kind of things happen? Sure, but they aren't aware of history at all anyway. They just, that's not something that they have in their um, toolkit the way we do today. Uh, so they are not really misreading the text in light of false historicity because they don't have any, um, they're not distorting them because they're not aware of the historicity issue at all in the first place. So with our modern literalism by contrast, um, we tend to have these dichotomies between whether something is literally true and as opposed to it being simply just fiction. 
So we have this sort of modern bias in favor of the historical, that a true story must have happened literally. So for the book of Exodus uh, to be true, we say, is Exodus a true story? Um, what people tend to be meaning there is, did it actually happen historically? Um, we shouldn't be focused on that, though. Uh, what actually is the case is not that whether or not it's history. History isn't necessarily true. History is simply something that happened. A story can have all sorts of true meanings. It could be a, an important allegory. It could have a true moral. And it could truly, in the case of what the medieval and ancient people want, it could truly point, the, point you to the divine, which is what a prophet writing wants, as opposed to uh, what a historian is interested in. So this is a false dichotomy as far as uh, a religious text should be concerned. And in fact, actually, um, it's, it's the opposite. So if something literally happened, uh, I would argue that this means it's in opposition to whether it had any true meaning. So if we insist that a story happened literally, it robs it actually of any potential for meaning. Because if something happened, it's just a thing that happened. It's a bunch of free agents, people, who choose to do things or don't, and that happens or not. Uh, and it can't necessarily have any meaning uh, underlying it that it has a, a kind of an intent, because it's frankly just what happened. So for example, uh, if we go back to that Exodus story, if the Exodus story were a literal history that happened uh, as written, the text would lack any deeper meaning for an allegory or significance to be written into the story because the people involved would have had to, have op had to operate if in accord with a preordained script. If it had happened as it was written, it would just be something that would happen. But actually, the way it's written, it's written with things like where it's continually saying, um, God hardened Pharaoh's heart that he would not let the people go. So the implication would be uh, that God is actually the author of the Egyptians' misfortune by uh, depriving Pharaoh of his free will. Uh, that's a theological claim as opposed to um, any way a historical claim. What we can say is from the Egyptian uh, evidence and from what the contemporary um, archaeology and everything else from the time period, uh, scholars are largely agreed that this is not actually a historical story. Okay, so there's some unexpected pitfalls in this post-Reformation uh, uh, experience of Scripture. So extreme focus on Scripture has often led, I think, to scriptural authoritarianism and it even can get to a place of scripture worship, uh, where we are just so focused, some groups, on uh, scripture that scripture, it becomes uh, God in place of actual relationship with God. Unfortunately, individual reading of scripture uh, by people who aren't trained in the study of ancient texts, who aren't trained either in history or in theology, frequently leads to irresponsible and often frankly, absurd misreadings of the text. And finally, as I'm trying to argue, literalism generally robs the text of any meaning uh, because it's simply focused on insisting that something literally happened and losing access to any of the meaning for what the story could have been intended to convey. And so <laughs> this is an e example that I just am always flabbergasted by, which is this giant uh, ark that has been built in Kentucky. Um, so an unexpected result of this democratization um, is if everybody's free to interpret scripture, what happens if he or she lacks the intellectual training to do so responsibly? Well, the answer often is that you make a giant um, theme park where you try to uh, logically explore what would happen if you had thousands of animals in there and they're having to eat and go to the bathroom and all this other kind of crazy stuff. It's not the point of the story. Um, but now we've lost the point, and instead uh, we are focused on this kind of preposterous logistics. All right. I want to, in my concluding component of this lecture, uh, look at uh, my uh, church's own tradition. So Community of Christ here comes out of a component of the Protestant Reformation called the Restoration, which has its own sort of really unique and bizarre um, 
uh, experience with scripture. And so um, we have here, this is a, a detailed image of uh, an angel holding spectacles and the prophet Joseph Smith holding uh, what he called her the golden plates. Uh, the source material uh, for his translation, for his composition of the Book of Mormon in his uh, testimony. So, um, when uh, in the early 19th century, in the 1820s and 30s, uh, uh, the early members were getting together to found the Restoration, their goal was to restore Christianity to the way it had been uh, at the time of Jesus and the apostles. Um, they weren't historians, so they had way less access to how um, uh, Jesus and people in the first century of Palestine might have lived. However, they did have a window to that ancient Christianity, to that primitive Christianity. Um, it's the same way that the people in the Renaissance had a window to classical civilization by looking at all of the recovered texts that they had from the Roman Empire. So too, early members of the Restoration had a window to early Christianity, which was the King James Bible. And so using those biblical texts as a guidebook, uh, the members called themselves the Church of Christ, which was the original name of this church when it was organized in 1830. And they established a bunch of different priesthood offices like elder, priest, teacher, and deacon um, that they found out about or they read about by reading the New Testament. Um, their goal and their framework, the Restoration's goal derived from its immediate historical context. In imagining, um, as some of the more extreme Protestants had argued, that the Christian church had undergone a great apostasy at the time of Constantine or earlier, um, they wanted to purge Christian practices that were inherited from tradition, in other words, the entire historical continuity of the Christian tradition, and instead replace them with practices that they recovered from the biblical text. And so they focused um, their agenda on scripture. Um, there's a picture here of the original temple uh, in our movement that is still uh, owned and maintained by Community of Christ, Kirtland Temple. Um, the idea, in a lot of cases, uh, there's very few Christian denominations that uh, have temples. Uh, and so why do they have a temple? It's because in the book of Acts, uh, in the New Testament, um, the apostles right in the immediate time frame after uh, Jesus' death continue to be meeting in the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, and that continues to be part of their primitive Christian practice. And so therefore, um, it was essential for members of the Restoration to have a temple to be doing the kinds of things that Peter and the apostles were said to have been doing uh, in the temple in Jerusalem. So following that roadmap, however, sometimes early members, uh, you know, really misread uh, the New Testament. So, for example, New Testament references, uh, they were the origin of revived practices that included things like the laying on of hands, feet washing, baptisms for the dead, um, the idea that there should be a priesthood office called 70, which is the office that I hold, um, and indeed certainly the idea that there should be an Aaronic and a Melchizedek priesthood. Um, both of the ideas of these two priesthoods derives from a long discourse by the author of the Epistle to Hebrews, um, but if you go through and read it now and think about it in our, you know, look at it in a scholarly way, you would actually find out that um, the restoration of a Melchizedek priesthood um, is an obvious misreading of the text of Hebrews. The restoration, therefore, began in that Protestant context uh, because the Bible had failed to make uh, definitive statements on 19th century Protestant controversies, and because for Protestants, Scripture was the sole authoritative source, as we saw, sectarianism has resulted. So Joseph Smith's solution uh, is, okay, if Scripture is the sole source of authority, what we need here is new Scripture that speaks to our own day. And so uh, his attempt then is to create that new Scripture beginning with the Book of Mormon dictation and then followed by other direct revelations and ultimately by revising the Bible itself, which he does in what's called either the Joseph Smith uh, Bible Revision, the Joseph Smith Translation, or it's sometimes called the Inspired Version of the Bible. All right, so Joseph Smith's contemporaries, 
um, seemed to be aware of what he was doing. So Alexander Campbell, who uh, was living at exactly the same time as Joseph Smith, uh, who was one of the founders of what's now called the Disciples of Christ, uh, the Churches of Christ, that Stone Campbell movement, he wrote uh, concerning the Book of Mormon, this prophet Smith, through his stone spectacles, wrote on the plates of Nephi in his Book of Mormon, every error and almost every truth discussed in New York for the last 10 years. He decides all the great controversies, infant baptism, ordination, the Trinity, regeneration, repentance, justification, the fall of man, the atonement, transubstantiation, fasting, penance, church government, religious experience, the call to ministry, the general resurrection, eternal punishment, who may baptize, and even the question of Freemasonry, Republican government, and the rights of man. In other words, the Book of Mormon, um, anyway, is not only replete with anachronisms, it specifically is um, speaking uh, authoritatively on all of the different subjects that were of concern immediately in that time frame. Um, in the course of uh, the publication of the Book of Mormon, um, there is also a revival of a scriptural prophetic voice. And so individual commandments, as they're initially called, they're also called covenants, revelation, inspired counsel, um, delivered by the prophet uh, to individual members, were published by the early church in what was called the Book of Commandments, and it was later they were republished and edited and republished in a book called the Doctrine and Covenants. And this saw a reinstitution of the tradition of the prophetic voice, which had existed in New Testament and especially Old Testament times. Even more than the Book of Mormon then, this creates scripture that speaks directly to the present. And this uh, tradition of uh, having a person called to be prophet whose role, whose calling is to bring inspired counsel to the church, that the church will then decide whether or not to include and canonize in its scripture is a tradition that continues uh, in community of Christ. Most audacious of all uh, for the early restoration was editing the Bible. So in the context of a Protestant culture that I'd say is close to erring on the side of Bible worship, the Joseph Smith Bible Revision, which is sometimes called the inspired version of the Joseph Smith Translation, is perhaps uh, Joseph Smith's most audacious interaction with Scripture as he personally assumed the right to delete, edit, and insert new passages into biblical text itself. So what, it all, what it all resulted from this? So I think that there are some unexpected gifts of this restoration tradition um, that I'm one of the heirs to. So I think reviving the practice of creating new scripture restored the closer perspective of the process experienced in primitive Christianity uh, as the texts were being created. For example, in antiquity, editing the texts was normal practice. So for example, um, as we've seen in our lecture on, on Q, uh, Luke and Matthew each felt quite free to edit uh, the Gospel of Mark and also to edit Q. And they changed and deleted and altered things. Uh, likewise, um, as we've seen in previous lectures, uh, the gospel attributed to John went through multiple reaction, uh, redactions, which is to say editors changing the text, adding to it, and so forth. Um, two editors added endings to Mark. We have the short ending, the long ending. Neither are original, uh, but people felt uh, able to add to them. And we've also seen in our lectures on the Old Testament uh, that the Pentateuch itself, the Torah, um, is a redaction of multiple sources. The most common hypothesis, the documentary hypothesis, is that there are four major sources that have been edited together by a uh, redactor, by an editor, to create what's now called the, uh, the Torah or the five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. Um, oh, I had a picture here. Uh, of the Jefferson Bible. So simultaneously, or a little bit earlier than Joseph Smith, um, Thomas Jefferson felt free at least to delete <laughs> from, from the Bible. He deleted everything that had uh, any, any components that were supernatural or anything like that and simply kept um, moral and ethical precepts. And so he had, took an exacto blade anyway and did sort of the same thing. Uh, Joseph Smith was more, had a, had a sharpie, he actually crossed stuff out and wrote new stuff in and added stuff. So.
Um, other things uh, that, are, that happened in the restorations um, uh, tradition of scripture. So there's new, what we call pseudepigrapha, which is to say uh, books that claim to be about people but who were not actually written in their time period and are not actually by them. So the Book of Mormon and the later Book of Abraham, which isn't part of our canon, but which is another um, text uh, uh, composed by Joseph Smith, uh, give us a better window into canonical pseudepigrapha, like the Book of Daniel, the Book of Ruth, both of, both of which were written centuries after the fact by authors who had little or no historical knowledge of the time in which those stories are set. And so we can see in our more modern uh, pseudepigrapha uh, examples of pseudepigraphical, how we understand pseudepigraphical works within the biblical canon itself. Um, what ends up happening is, is those texts speak to the spiritual needs of the author's time. So the book of Daniel is speaking very particularly to a time period when uh, the people in Judea are struggling against uh, the the Seleucids, the, uh, the Greeks, uh, who were attempting to uh, Hellenize uh, and eliminate uh, Jewish practices. Uh, it doesn't speak to Daniel's time when Daniel is in Babylon as an exile. Uh, likewise, the story of Ruth, which is set, um, she's the uh, great-grandmother or something of, of King David, uh, but it's actually speaking to the time when the exiles have returned uh, and Ezra and his contemporaries are forbidding intermarriage between uh, the people of Judah and the Moabites. So in other words, both of those texts speak to their actual context, uh, not to the setting when they were. Likewise, as we saw, the Book of Mormon doesn't really speak at all to, um, uh, let's say, second or third or, or century BC and AD uh, Native Americans, but it does speak quite directly to uh, people in New York in the year 1829 and 1830. Um, the Joseph Smith uh, Moses, for example, Joseph Smith's translation of Moses um, is a literary creation, and in fact, that is quite simple. Uh, it's quite similar to all the biblical Moses stories, which are all literary creations, not history. Um, Another unexpected gift that is continued in Community of Christ is the idea of opening the canon and experiencing the prophetic process close at hand gives us a better perspective for understanding the ancient practice. We can see that prophecy is a human response to the divine that is limited by the prophet's own context, and we can see that the prophet speaks to his or her own contemporaries, and this is a picture um, of the World Conference of Community of Christ uh, voting to canonize uh, section 164 of the Doctrine and Covenants, one of the second most recent um, uh, components of our canon of Scripture. So, so with these lenses, with restoration lenses that we have, this experience of Scripture that is 19th, 20th, and 20th centuries, I think we can avoid uh, the too common pitfall of scriptural authoritarianism we can understand that scripture is not to be worshiped or idolized, which is a component of community of Christ scripture, DNC 163.7, but that instead should be responsibly and meaningfully, but not literally read in order to do as Augustine uh, uh, led Christians through in antiquity in the Middle Ages to do in order to point us to the divine who alone is worthy of worship. And so, um, that is my perspective of the Bible as seen through Reformation, Reformation lenses and potential correctives that we anyway have in my particular tradition of the Restoration. I hope you found it interesting. Thank you. Leandro, do we have questions or comments? Yes, we, uh, we do have a few questions and comments. I will read them to you. Uh, well, we have Nathan Gale uh, on YouTube. Uh, could you comment on the similarities and differences between different religious communities uh, in, their approach to, in their approach to scripture? Or in other words, can you speak on how people in non-Abrahamic religions approach oh. their scripture? 
Well, it's going to be very, um, there's a lot of variety. <laughs> so when we, are, I, I'd also, anytime I'm going to do an overview like this um, and even talk about Christianity, um, Christianity is a is a, such a vast uh, array of how people are you know view things, and it'll be everything uh, across the gamut from um, people who are doing a very, um, I would say, literalistic view where they're really just focused on uh, the Bible as some kind of a historical witness to the supernatural, uh, which is a misunderstanding of history and the historical process. So there's, on the one hand, that's happening. On the other hand, there are people within Catholicism, within all of the different Protestant denominations who are um, just uh, the foremost scholars of all of this. It was those um, uh, technical experts with, who were religious who created uh, the disciplines of history and literary criticism and even archaeology in some cases anyways, in order to, um, in order to understand the text. Uh, that was their goal uh, of it. Um, so if we go outside of uh, uh, Judeo-Christianity and even, um, uh, there's, a difference, there's a difference between how text is viewed in across, in across Judaism than Christianity. Um, Judaism, for example, uh, there is so much more uh, appreciation because of the focus on the original language um, that you are closer to the text in a lot of ways when you uh, go to Hebrew school and you are studying the text. So you really are, um, you're reading that if you go to um, synagogue every week, you're reading through the whole Pentateuch, you know, in the course of uh, whatever it is, a multi-year cycle. Uh, and so you are very familiar with those texts and you're familiar with them in the uh, original language. Um, nevertheless, the focus is less on, uh, when I've been to different um, Jewish synagogues, there, it's less on the uh, uh, overall scholarship. So the, you may not uh, be familiar even with the documentary hypothesis of the, com uh, the composition of the Torah. So you may be not understanding um, the historical context, let's say. Uh, certainly lots of Jewish scholars do know all that, but it may not be part of the regular uh, worship. Um, Islam is, again, a little bit different because the text is um, not to be translated. And if you translate it, it's, um, you're no longer, you're, no, you're just having the, the meaning or the, the sense of the, of the scripture of Quran. The real Quran has to be spoken in, in the original, and it's really about uh, recitation as opposed to reading. Um, and so it is approached in a somewhat different way, uh, again, uh, in, in terms of Islam. Um, there's a bunch of other religions that are all over the place in terms of scripture. Scripture isn't always the most important thing to, um, to a religion. Uh, in Sikhism, uh, scripture is really important because their guru is the, the book. And so if you go to a Sikh Gurdwara, which is where the guru lives, which is, where, which is the book itself of their scripture, um, you can go at the end of the day to the, um, the ritual where they close the book and they do all the prayers. The book is um, taken around on the people's heads and then they take it to the bed and the guru, the, bed, the scripture actually goes to bed and it wakes up in the morning again or is brought up out in the morning. So it's uh, a very interesting ritual with the, with the scripture uh, in Sikhism. Um, I'm trying to think of some other <laughs> ones. Uh, the Zoroastrians, we have the Zoroastrian temple here. Um, the Zoroastrian scripture is amazingly ancient, uh, but for a whole long time, uh, because it's kept in this uh, dead you know, language that it hasn't been spoken for thousands of years, um, uh, the priests even didn't necessarily know what they were even saying. So they didn't necessarily know what it, what it meant for a whole long time. And so it was more important to get the rituals and the words and everything like that right than, than the content. And so there's just going to be a vast spectrum of differences between how people are viewing and using scripture in the different religions. And in some cases, um, again, the, the book is not the most important thing. Uh, we tend to have a bias because of Abrahamic religions of making the book so important. But it may well be that even though there are scripture in Hinduism, that the actual individual um, uh, worship and rituals and things that you do at a Hindu temple may be more important than reading the scripture. I would like to add uh, to that uh, through uh, my own experience in, in a Buddhist uh, Sangha that there isn't an understanding that scripture is something revealed. Mm. And so well, you don't see scripture as something that is somehow 
revealed or inspired in any divine, um, uh, anything divine. It's, it's, it's something that expresses, uh, it's trying to express something about the divine, but it's not necessarily revealed. Mm. Uh, Nathan also uh, asks whether we can think of Quakerism, Mormonism, Pentecostalism, etc., and in those uh, uh, religions movements as a uh, sort of a counter revolutionary movements against mainline Protestantism. Sure. <laughs> so yes. So yes. In fact, um, um, they're all emerging out of a Protestant experience. Uh, but they all innate, innate, uh, innately have their own kind of reactions against it. So I went through a little bit about um, the Restoration, uh, which goes in a couple different directions, including, you know, like mainline uh, Mormonism. Uh, and in some ways, there, it's a reaction to um, some of the uh, Protestantism, especially of Second Great Awakening North America. Uh, Quakers emerge a little earlier than that, um, and they do definitely... Um, uh, they're definitely opposed to a bunch of the different, um, uh, let's say, reforms that are happening in the Anglican tradition. Um, the Quakers do not feel that the um, that the Anglicans have gone anywhere near far enough, and so they've taken they took it to a much um, deeper level of eliminating, you know, more sacraments, more of those kind of practices, of uh, reliance more on the Holy Spirit, and of of commitment to. Um, activism, like especially uh, causes like being a peace church, so to passivism, uh, to fighting slavery and other kinds of injustice. So Quakerism really, you know, is a um, put your principles where your mouth is kind of kind of uh, tradition. The Pentecostals um, um, is a is a focus maybe against too much. Um, uh, too much study and not enough charisma, not enough passion in the in the Protest in the kind of uh, Protestants egghead Protestant sermons from Harvard kind of church. Um, and instead, to uh, to really be um, embracing a sort of experiential uh, component of it. And so, I, yeah, I, I would say so. Uh, Paula Strange uh, is a little confused about the difference between allegorical and tropological. Could you speak a little bit on that? Yeah. Um, so allegorical um, is when we are, um, so, so there's a couple different ways. So, so I didn't put on the word, uh, so we have tropological, but we also have uh, topology, <laughs> which is you know, like type and anti-type as opposed to tropological. Um, so uh, topology is more like the allegory. So if we're doing an allegorical reading, um, I mean, we can obviously see those in, in for example, teachings that are, um, uh, well, parables are not even necessarily allegories because they're actually trying to get you to think. Uh, a, a, an allegorical um, a reading would be something like uh, uh, the flood um, in Noah's story, uh, it covers the whole earth in water, and that that is allegorizes uh, Christian baptism. Uh, and so, and so Christians in the Middle Ages read that story um, as an allegory uh, of the need for um, baptism to uh, cleanse sin. So the authors of the flood story didn't have that in mind. That wasn't their intent. But that's the allegorical reading that, as it would have been read, let's say, in antiquity and in the Middle Ages and up to the present day uh, by Christians. Uh, in terms of um, the tropological, it's more like um, not reading it now as an allegory, but now there's a moral to the story. So now we see, um, uh, you know, let's say, the, you know, as you're reading it, you've, these kind of actions are going to um, be the consequences of sin, or if you have, um, uh, if you are going around and you, you, you take this kind of an action, uh, you'll lead to ruin because you've forgotten what really matters most, you know. And so, um, you, there, there would be, let's say, a moral to uh, the story of Job, 
you know, at the end of the day, this kind of perseverance that there's no point, to, that you, there's no reason for someone to curse God for your misfortunes, whatever the moral of the story we want to draw out of the story, that would be the, the tropological. And then the finally is the anagogical, is this idea then is how does all of this together um, get us to contemplate uh, God and the divine? And so there would be different ways that we can do that. So one of the, um, one of the uh, spiritual experiences and practices that we uh, do uh, here is that Leandro, um, at 8 o'clock on Wednesdays, um, does uh, the Logos meditation, which is Lectio Divina. Uh, and so instead of um, taking apart the, the text uh, historically by doing exegetical work, by looking at context, by all those kind of things, um, it's part of a uh, spiritual practice of experiencing the text uh, so that the text is helping us um, maybe mystically or otherwise experientially uh, commune with the divine. And so that's the idea of it. So the text has m meanings and um, purposes that are other than just finding a history book. If the text was simply a history book, why is it scripture? There's all kinds of history books that we have that would be quite good histories of ancient peoples, the Hittites or something like that, biblical peoples. That doesn't make it scripture just because something happened. What's important instead with scripture is uh, that it's doing these other things as opposed to history. Leon D. Berg, uh, a question that it reminds me we have a full lecture on this. Why does the Reformation eventually bring along non-biblical traditions like Christmas and December, Easter in the spring, clerical robes, <laughs> etc.? <cetera? laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of an interesting question. So um, why, why do Protestants celebrate Christmas? And um, the answer actually originally in the United States was that uh, the original war on Christmas is that the Protestants were against it. <laughs> and so the Protestants were the ones that tried to ban it. They really were opposed to it because as far as they were concerned, Christmas was uh, entirely a drinking party uh, and where people were doing this kind of pagan uh, drinking and this kind of thing. And so they would ban those kind of holidays. Uh, but it ended up ultimately being too popular that kind of the compromise deal that was made that was kind of to push the um, to push the drinking off to New Year's, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that's how in practice I think kind of things evolved. I mean, people maybe still drink a little on Christmas, but that's not the point. Now the point is uh, to worship consumerism, <laughs> you know, and so now it's all about the presence and materialism and all that kind of thing. So that's the everybody way we can agree in, um, in our uh, 21st century material economy. But yeah, so it's, it's a thing that the Protestants were, were trying to fight. Uh, in terms of clerical robes, a lot of Protestants got rid of that. So, uh, but it's a matter of deciding uh, when you were a Protestant, what's the part that you want to keep and what's the part that you don't. And so, um, it's by their name, Episcopalians, you know, so Episcopalians kept bishops because that's Greek for bishop, right? Episcopos. Um, uh, Presbyterians kept presbyters. <laughs> you know, different different kinds of components were important, and so some of the uh, people kept to kind of a cleric, a clerical, and some of them made an entirely lay clergy. So there's no uh, no outfits, and so much to my um, in this congregation, in this tradition, I don't get to have a fancy hat, <laughs> and uh, someday we're going to figure that out and get hats. Because no I, one's stopping you, John. I don't know. I'm going to see about getting getting a hat. So. <laughs> Uh, for Leon and anyone interested in the topic, the lecture is called The Pagan Roots of Christmas, oh. and it's available on our YouTube channel. So uh, look for uh, Center Place on YouTube. We have Ivan Charlie say, uh, asking, do you think the, that new pseudepigrapha could or would be written in the Restoration? The restoration? Um, it's It'll be tough. <laughs> so um, what it, I actually uh, propose this. <laughs> so um, I, I, and I think it actually is, is a worthwhile exercise. I think we, we should consider it. So uh, for many years, I taught um, the Restoration Scripture uh, course in a program in our church called Discipleship Now. And so it would be, we have a, um, it's a three-year kind of course that people who were interested, a lot of times pastors, 
um, kind of devote to what's some kind of um, a light, it's not really, it's not a theology degree, but it's the kind of thing like that. And so, um, and when I was teaching that course on Restoration Scripture, kind of the culminating um, activity or exercise was to try to get people to, um, as a spiritual practice, uh, prayerfully, thoughtfully compose their own scripture. And so it could have been even in terms of a, um, an epistle. So they're writing um, counsel to their grandchildren. Or it could be a psalm. They're writing a poem or, or a hymn. So those are, it could be a prayer. It could be a sermon. There's all kinds of things, but it could also be an allegory. It could be a parable. And um, it, I was always very hesitant and scared to assign that to people because you feel like, oh, this is very flippant and people maybe um, uh, will recoil at the idea of it. Uh, and a couple people, you know, it was completely allowed that you didn't have to do it. A couple people didn't, but it would routinely um, generate just these amazing um, texts that just the people in the class uh, would bring to the class and share and there would be the tears and it would be amazing. So um, I think it's something that is doable. Um, I have occasionally talked to people, um, other leaders, I've talked to people about uh, the idea of um, gathering people together to um, really thoughtfully work on something that we might call a testament of the restoration where we um, individually are writing very different things and bring that together for a worship resource. So I, I think it's not inconceivable. There's not necessarily any, any particular precedent to imagine that it would happen, but it doesn't, there's nothing preventing it, I think. We have uh, a question from Bell, who um, comes to center place. Yeah. Did the Protestants, uh, sorry, did the Protestant focus on scripture influence how Catholics interact with or interpreted the Bible? Yes. <laughs> yes, so um, definitely. And so one of the things that ha happened is, is that everything that happens in history is action and reaction and people react against things. So one of our, um, one of our points of um, presentism is that we, we tend to understand that there is a continuity in Catholicism between, for example, um, the Catholic Church of the year 1700 and the Catholic Church in the year 1300. But on the other hand, um, what we have to kind of understand still is, is that there's also a difference because um, the Protestants and all the people who become Protestants by 1700 were all included in the church in 1300. And so in a way, it's not, in, in a sense, the post Protestant Catholic Church, even though there is broad institutional continuity, because the Catholics, um, uh, inevitably, the people who are left within the institution react to what the Protestants are saying and what the Protestants are doing. Um, and so um, there is a, I mean, they're also existing in the time period with the invention of the printing press. They also are therefore getting access to Bibles. Um, but I think you'll, um, um, maybe be aware of, if you anyway talk to people who grew up Catholic, the, uh, there's not the kind of focus on Bible reading and having Bibles and this kind of thing. That's not, generally speaking, still the central practice. It's not that there aren't, the scholarship continues, uh, but it's not uh, their central focus the same way it is in Protestantism. So there is a difference in how it's viewed uh, because you can't help but react to what all the, what the Protestants are saying. Uh, nevertheless, um, it has, it may be in reaction, it didn't, they didn't take that and make that central to their religious practice. I, I can say, speak for myself, that um, we, we did have catechism class, but however, that, we, that scripture was not something to study. Instead, you had to learn the prayers, and there's a lot of very, very lengthy prayers that you were supposed to memorize. And one of the first things that shocked me the first time I entered a Protestant church is that everything is written. And it's just, it's like cheating, right? <laughs> like you, you, yeah. sp you spend all this time learning and now here you can just read it of, of a booklet. I know, exactly, yeah. And I, so my experience, because I have this background, is that um, in the Restoration we really didn't have any, we, except for the uh, communion prayers, we didn't have any rote prayers, right? And so therefore, um, I really don't even have, 
I don't know. I mean, I can probably do the Lord's Prayer, but that's about it. I can't. I certainly can't do Hail Mary or or the um, the Nicene Creed. <laughs> I mean, I mean, we, anyway, it'd be neat if I knew it. But anyway, I don't know it. I mean, I know the as it's not not part of our tradition. So yeah, so it's different. Okay, I have one more from Leon, uh, who says, the, uh, what, two things, a comment and a question. The reorganization has had a history of, thus says the spirit, uh, writings from individual in the church who yes. are not general leadership. Right? Yeah. Uh, but he is asking if you could please give a quick definition of pseudepigrapha. Yes. Um, so pseudepigrapha, uh, in general, what it means is... Um, writing that it's um, written in the name of somebody who is not the author. So if you are going to, um, there'll be like a text that didn't make it into the Bible that would be like the apocalypse of Adam. And it's, it might even say, I, Adam, am writing this text. But Adam didn't write that text because Adam is in fact not a historical person. You know? And so the text is pseudepigraphic in the sense that it is someone's writing it, they are claiming to be Adam, um, but in fact, they are not, in fact, Adam. And so that would also be true, for example, um, of the epistles of Peter in the New Testament. So they claim that they're being written by Peter, but we can tell um, very clearly, uh, literary criticism, uh, that Second Peter is, in fact, just a, a redacted edit of, of Jude. And so therefore, it's clearly not by Peter. It's simply somebody expanding um, on the epistle of Jude. And so, uh, uh, so that would be pseudepigrapha inside the canon uh, because it's claiming to be written by somebody that it's not. Now there's a bunch of different um, texts that are anonymous and that therefore are not actually technically pseudepigraphical. And so the four gospels are not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, but it's not that they claim to be, they don't make that claim at all. Um, they're simply anonymous texts that got assigned authorship by tradition um, that tradition is not uh, doesn't have any real historical basis for it. It's simply um, something that, that early Christians in the second century uh, started assigning names. Uh, similarly, there are certain Pauline epistles that most scholars uh, believe are pseudepigraphical, that they're written in Paul's name pretending to be Paul, but the epistle to Hebrews, by contrast, even though um, ancient people thought it was written by Paul and therefore put it in the canon because they thought it was, it's in fact an anonymous text. It's not written by Paul, but it doesn't claim to be written by Paul. So in that sense, it's not pseudepigraphical. And so the Book of Mormon claims to be written by uh, characters, Mormon, Nephi, and so forth. Um, it's not written by people like that. It's, uh, the composition is by Joseph Smith, and so therefore it's a pseudepigraphical text. Uh, we have Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Elizabeth, can you hear us? Hi. Yes, Hi. yes, but, but unfortunately, unfortunately um, um, I, I, I think I, I, think I, I should I turn, off turn off John, John because... John. Oh, yeah, you have to turn off the Facebook or the YouTube. The one on the other. What have I got? This is Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> this is YouTube. All right, all right. Yeah, these are the joys of Zoom and live streaming at the same time. Okay. Okay, you got it. There you go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Are you going to sing a song? Oh, I wasn't, oh, going, I wasn't going to. Going no. to no. <laughs> <laughs> What's your question? Oh, oh. Uh, I, I, I guess, I guess, I guess my, I guess my question, question is, is um, um, what did I what just did miss? I just miss? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully it was a good lecture. I, I think we it went well, and we certainly what you did miss is we miss you. Uh, it was, it's so wonderful to have you here in person and all of our regulars. And so um, anyway, we just miss you so much. And we look forward to a time when life is more normal again. <laughs> but I'm glad we were able to, I'm able to hear your voice and we're able to, um, anyway, just converse. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, uh, if, uh, if, if this were if a this proper, proper Zoom, Zoom I, I, would I would be visible, be visible as, as well as audible. audible. Um, um, I, I, have I, I have to say Karen Armstrong, Karen Armstrong would agree, agree with you. Agree with you. Does agree, Does with, agree you. with you. Judging by, Judging her, latest by her latest book. book. Oh, okay, very good. Yeah, so, yeah, well, so that's I good think company so to too. be in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, very good. Um, I thank you for joining us, and I thank everybody for joining us, Elizabeth and Leon and all the other people who were commenting.
Nate. And uh, anyway, we just really appreciate that. And next week, um, we're going to begin our series on pandemics and plagues. <laughs> and, so, and so we'll have our, um, our lecture next week on lessons learned from the Black Death. And so you'll probably want to turn tune in for that one. Yeah, and yeah, maybe you maybe can you send can us send the, us um, the, um, the YouTube, the, 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 the whatever, whatever, this one. This one. Okay, yeah. This yep. one. This so this I, will. I have your email, Elizabeth, so we'll send it to you. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. okay. No, thanks. Thanks. Good, Thank night. Good night. Take care. Good night, Take care. everybody. Bye.